Well, and welcome to another episode of Leaders of Transformation. Today, we're going to talk about making businesses planet positive. How do you do that? We have heard this term sustainability, and there's been a lot of talk around it, but how do you actually implement this in your business? And so our guest is going to share with us how they help companies do it. I'm really excited to have with us here today, Smita Mishra, and she is the founder of Fandoro, which is a SaaS platform which helps businesses become planet positive through the adoption of the UN Sustainability uh, Development Goals Framework, which we'll talk a little bit more about. I met her on Facebook and somebody connected us and we can't figure out who it was. It was last year and she reached out to me just recently and we had a conversation and it was just the perfect timing to have this conversation and to be able to share this with you. So I'm really excited to have her here. Smita, welcome to Blues Transformation. Thank you so much, Nicole. Thank you for having me here. It's an honor and great pleasure to be able to speak with you. Well, and it's a pleasure to have you. And I appreciate you. You're in India right now. And I know that when we were scheduling our time and so forth, you were like, well, I can get up at 2.30 in the morning. And I'm like, no, we're not <laughs> going to do that. So I just appreciate you accommodating us with your time. And it's not 2.30 for those of you that are listening. It is 8.30 at night for her, but she's taking the time out of her a day to share with us and I'm just excited to, to get into this. So let's start off with the Sustainable Development Goals Agenda. What is that and where did that, where did that start? Um, so there's a long history, Nicole, if we look at um, how sustainability progressed uh, through different years and in fact decades uh, across the globe. And uh, in fact, much before these SDGs came into play, the Sustainable Development Goals came into play, there were, um, I believe, eight uh, MDGs, Millennium Development Goals. And uh, to be honest, we did pretty well on them. In fact, we met quite a few of those goals, but we didn't meet all of them. And uh, much like any situation, the climate, uh, there were a lot of factors which, uh, while these MDGs were being met, uh, these factors kept changing, in fact, for the worse. So that's where we needed a new, broader uh, set of goals, which would meet the needs of the new world, which was coming up in terms of challenges with respect to the climate, gender, uh, poverty, healthcare, while some of them were being addressed by MDGs. But um, I believe in 1987, there was a, a, a UN, United Nations, uh, uh, some kind of forum. It was the climate forum where uh, the then, uh, I don't remember what position she was in, but Ms. Gro uh, Harlem Brandelt, she was uh, uh, leading this climate change uh, process and she was leading this whole uh, initiative of uh, how to bring in sustainable development. And in fact, this term sustainable development has been coined by her. And uh, in 1987, she, there was this report, which is called uh, Brandelt, uh, Brandland, in fact, Brandland Report. And that is the report where this term was first found. What it means actually is to be able to meet our needs of the present without having to compromise on the resources and needs of the future. That is sustainable development. You grow in a way where you're not compromising the future growth. And uh, that's where it started. And now we have a whole uh, framework, SDG framework, which uh, got formed in 2015. The whole goal is to meet these, uh, the whole idea is to meet these goals of the framework uh, by 2030. And it's called Agenda 2030, comprising of about 17 goals, 169 targets, and over 232 indicators. And now, sometimes the indicators could vary for different nations, uh, but more or less uh, 232 indicators on this. And uh, that's our final goal that we have, we are, all the 193 nations have come together and signed up to meet uh, these 169 targets of 17 goals. So that's what Agenda 2030 is for you. And that's, a, there's a lot, like I've looked at it, I read through the agreement and there are, I mean, these are not small goals. We're talking about ending poverty, yes. ending in inequality. I mean, big goals and collectively, e any one of them is a large goal. And then collectively, it's a pretty monumental task. And so that's where when I started to read about it 
and was looking at your platform, I was thinking, well, yeah, I mean, without something that you can use to measure how you're doing um, and have some accountability to that, how would we possibly tackle these goals? And so it was brilliant for you to come up with this idea to do this. So kind of where did that, where did that come from? You told me you're, you come from a background in tech, but not SaaS platforms. So yeah, where did this start for you? Where did the, the inspiration come from to do this? So uh, you're right, Nicole. I am actually a technology person and I'm a computer science engineer starting from my first job to the last one I had. It's all about project management, product management, testing, uh, end-to-end -end technology. And I, uh, still, uh, I have worked on SaaS platforms, but not on sustainability. And when I uh, wanted to, like I was continuing to do my work and uh, continuing to do some consulting in testing. And then there came a point where I was, uh, okay, now uh, it's, it's like the last 20, 25 years of my active life. What do I want to do? How do I want to, uh, you know, finish the race with some impact? And I was like, uh, I have to uh, solve some major problem. I cannot just say, okay, I worked on technology, but uh, when I look around here in India, there are so many problems, so many issues. And how come I am just living in my own isolation, working for some tech company and not looking at them? Why, uh, I don't mean to say that tech companies are not solving problems. Uh, somehow my kind of work did not really impact uh, people around, citizens around uh, naturally. And so I started to look for uh, that kind of work. And that's where I, uh, of course, like I mentioned again, that there are tons of problems here everywhere you look around. Uh, we have, as a, as a nation, we have highest number of road accidents. We have seven out of 10 top uh, most air polluting cities of the world in my country. Uh, we have uh, quite skewed gender diversity in terms of uh, ratio, sex ratio at birth, as well as uh, if you look at working women and their pay, and there's uh, the whole uh, disparity is pretty high. And at the same time, uh, if you look at poverty, we have uh, quite, I, I believe one fourth of our population is uh, still very, very poor. Of course, the poorest of the poor is not there, which we used to have when we were, we got independent, but we still have about a fourth of our population, which is poor and uh, which we would call below poverty line, which uh, United Nations, I believe, recognizes as dollar one and 20 cents per day, somebody living below that. So uh, that made me think about that. What is it that I want to really solve? And then I looked at people who are actually solving these problems. There are so many specialists doing such great work. And I had no uh, idea or insight into how, how to solve these problems. And these people were doing awesome. And while uh, the reason they're not able to solve it is because the problem is among us. So I decided that instead of trying to get into one space and trying to solve it, uh, I would rather uh, be somebody who facilitates these people to solve major problems, who brings in together the factors, the people who can actually make a dent, push through these changes and bring out the best solutions and implement them. And that's where I came uh, across SDG framework. And I found it to be a very beautiful framework, which has woven in uh, all kinds of issues together. And very rightly, because again, you can't solve poverty without solving healthcare, which you cannot solve without solving education. And all of this leads to climate issues anyway. So it's like, you can't just solve one problem in isolation. You have to solve them all at once. And that's where I came to this. Uh, in fact, it was, I always say that I did not choose this framework. The framework chose me to get uh, started on the work. And I definitely realized that business is, uh, uh, is a force. You can use businesses as a force to make that change because they have the power of collective people. And uh, that's where uh, we are now building a SaaS platform where uh, we would like these businesses and enterprises to adopt sustainable development goals. Yeah. Well, you're talking my language because that's like with the Leaders of Transformation. I, prior to starting Le the Leaders of Transformation podcast and the different initiatives that have come out of that, I used to think, well, okay, which is the thing that I want to solve and that I want to focus in on? And it was like, yes, this is important, but the, so is this, and so is that, and so is this. And 
And I realized that with my background experience, just like you, it's like you look at it and you go, what, how can I use what I have? Which is like when I coach entrepreneurs, I'm teaching them the same, same thing. It's like, what are your strengths, your passion, your experience, and how can you use that to build, uh, to number one, establish your purpose and then to build a profitable business around it so, you, so that you can do it and make a difference in the world. And, and so it's the same thing. It's like, well, rather than me trying to solve one problem and make it, maybe making a tiny dent, what if I brought together the people and showcase the people that were making a difference and so that we could eliminate the silos and so that, you know, the, the people who are trying to do the same things could then work together and accelerate their progress. And so we're still in the midst of doing that. We haven't gotten there. We haven't achieved the goal completely yet, of course, but we're on the way. And, and that's why when I saw what you were doing with your platform, I was like, this is brilliant. And in not just in, it's a great idea to build a cool platform that people can use, but thinking beyond that into the businesses that, that want to make a difference, but don't know how to measure it. And if we're expecting each business to figure that out on their own, then it's very redundant, the effort that goes into figuring out how to do that. Whereas if someone says, look, why don't we just create a platform where you can use it and we've already figured out all of those, answered all those questions, and now you just need to apply it. So then the energy can go towards making the impact as opposed to figuring out how you're going to measure the impact. So I really love that. So talk about how this platform works. What if somebody is, a, let's say a business owner that's out there listening and they're saying, okay, well, I'm interested. Is this only for large enterprises that have multi-million dollar budgets that can hire you? Or is this for small businesses as well? And how do they engage with it? Absolutely, Nicole. I'll be very happy to share that. But before I get into it, I have to acknowledge that one thing you just said was people working in silos, even if they're working towards the same cause, that is such a huge challenge. Even well-meaning people with all the good intentions, they are not able to bring out that impact for the simple reason they're not collaborating with each other. Data is not being shared, information is not passing. And if they came together, if anybody said that, okay, I'm, I'm working in XYZ space, I'm working for poverty, let's just bring all people together. I think that's gonna solve a bigger problem than, you know, because it will be a systemic force then. And that's not happening right now, at least not uh, not to the level that's required. Yeah. yeah. Coming, coming to uh, uh, what Pandoro does is, uh, yes, uh, it definitely serves large customers. But the whole idea is to work towards the smaller and medium businesses and to involve growth stage startups. Uh, in my last two and a half years of experience of working in this space, what I've realized is that large enterprises are still uh, doing some part. So a lot of people do relate sustainability to CSR. Yes, there is an overlap. The corporate social responsibility it is not 100 percent the same but there is an overlap uh, so a lot of people uh, work through their csr funds on sustainability as a large firm because there is a regulat reg uh, regulatory requirement for them to have a certain percentage of their profits to go to the csr so that is happening and uh, besides just working for a uh, regulatory reason large enterprises are recognizing the importance of being a sustainable brand and uh, creating a different, being a uh, differentiator, building that as a differentiator instead of a feature-led differentiator or a product-led differentiator, they understand that sustainability could become a point of, uh, they could give it, uh, it could give them purpose and talkability, so they are adopting it more. However, when we come to the SMB business, SMB plan, uh, landscape, it's a huge landscape. In fact, it would probably be the largest number of uh, if single units, if I would say number of units spice SMBs would be largest, whether it is uh, US, whether it is India, uh, somehow these people are just not talking sustainability. They need to talk sustainability and it's like totally gone from the landscape of uh, sustainability. And uh, growth stage startups, which are well-funded, uh, we want to target them. We definitely want to work with them because we think they are in a great uh, position and place to make a change. The new uh, people, the millennials, definitely want to work with a purpose. They do not just work for money. They are very passionate people. 
unlike the previous generations. Uh, no offense to them, but uh, the newer generations are more uh, generous. They are more passionate. They find, they want to work with a purpose. They do not want to just work. It's like for them, what does the brand stand for? So we definitely want to uh, the startups to capitalize on such uh, people and bring a change. And so we want to work with uh, SMBs and uh, growth, uh, sorry, growth stage startups for sure. That's and when I looked at your website, I saw that you had packages like, so you have monthly packages, they sign up for a monthly package. I think your first package was like $35 a month. So we're not talking millions of dollars or even thousands of dollars to be set up on it to start with. And then what happens in the platform? So, so you help them measure where they're at in the different areas and then how to, so that, and then they, so tell us, yeah, how it works. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it's a SaaS platform, which is software as a service. So it's more, it's a subscription based service. So you can, uh, it's more like pay as you go. So uh, if you want to take the service this month and then you don't want to take it, you just have to pay for this month. So it's in that model. Okay. Uh, we do have a premium model of which the free part we haven't yet mentioned there <laughs> currently, but we are going to put that. Uh, however, uh, the whole process is we first do, uh, we first try to do sustain, uh, build the sustainability roadmap for a startup or a SMB. So for a startup, it's $35 a month for a, a small and medium business or a growth stage startup. Uh, I would say it is uh, $115 a month. So, uh, and the services we provide is we first do their SDG mapping. What that means is we identify which are those uh, sustainable development goals where the businesses are naturally aligned with. So they don't have to step out of their business to bring a change. They can very well optimize in, within their business functions, which could be supply chain, their products or services they are offering, their daily operations that we are working on, or the extended value chain that uh, I'm considering the whole value chain. So uh, we kind of map those uh, areas with different SDGs and we tell them that these are the set of SDGs, let's say four, five, six, whatever numbers, where you are naturally working on. So if you want to make a change, you don't have to step out. Once that is done, then we also do a materiality an analysis for them. What materiality means is uh, uh, air quality, water quality, everything is an important thing. Every, all of these could be important for, uh, for when we look at it as a common person. But for a business, not everything is material. You want to bring a change, but it has to align with your business uh, goals also. You can't bring, make change in all the direction. So that's where uh, we make a list of uh, those materiality by uh, we prioritize them for the stakeholders, for the management, for the even the operations team, which is going to actually implement these goals on uh, ground and they do a feasibility check which ones they can actually implement which one they cannot so that uh, it's not just a goal set by the management and the operations team is struggling to implement because this is uh, mostly people don't look at it as a profit making thing they look at it as a cost center they look at it as something they have to do extra somehow most much like an MIS reporting so uh, you need uh, to make sure that it's doable so we do that uh, we analyze the materiality, we do the SDG mapping, and we set up a benchmarking as to on those particular goals, where do they stand today? And that completes our process of building their sustainability roadmap, which is the part one. And basis that those goals, if they want to improve on them, we suggest them improvement programs. We let them create their own programs. We also give them uh, some intelligent suggestions, which are based on the publicly available data, which could actually tell you that geography wise, and vertical wise. So if you are, uh, uh, let's say a soil testing company in uh, Brazil, then what have other soil testing companies in Brazil done uh, for sustainable projects? Which one of them were successful? Which one of them were not successful? What were, what is your chances of being successful? So that you have, you take a calculated risk that I'm going to invest so much money for so much of time. So what are my chances? So for those kind of analysis, we provide them some uh, uh, guidance, but you are free to create your own programs. We help you do program management, which is our third part. So even if you create your own program, implement it yourself, we can help you do the overall program management, uh, giving you the metrics and making sure that your program is on path, then measuring your impact. And the last module we have is sustainability reporting. Now, interestingly, uh, sustainability reporting is not new. Uh, GRI, the uh, GRI is a 
most popular and SASB. These are the two most popular such, uh, reporting formats. And uh, a lot of countries have made it mandatory for a lot of their companies to uh, publicly disclose their uh, work in sustainable uh, development space. And that is in the sustainability reporting. Uh, that comes in the sustainability reporting, which they can either give as a uh, overall report in their annual report, or they can give as a independent reporting. So it can be either integrated with the report or independent report on sustainability. Interestingly, in India, uh, thousand top uh, com listed companies in our stock exchange are supposed to are mandatorily supposed to disclose this. So it's called voluntary disclosure, but they are supposed to disclose this information. Uh, about what they are doing in uh, sustainable development and uh, we, the way forward is uh, the way I look at it is that it's only going to get increased because we started with 100 companies and started with 100 companies being mandatory uh, falling under this re regulatory requirement of uh, disclosing their work in sustainable development and it has extended to already 1000 companies so uh, we feel that it's going to further get increased to 2,000, 5,000 companies. So we help them do that for uh, build their uh, reporting. But that is currently on the Sustainable Development Goal Framework, SDG Framework, which has a very beautiful uh, mapping on the GRI, with the GRI. So GRI accepts that SDG is a very good framework. So on their sites, you, whether it is SASB, whether it is GRI, you will always find a good mapping with SDG reporting. So that's what we finally do. So I'm starting from sustainability report, uh, roadmap building to improvement programs, to program management, to reporting. We help them do all of it. That's what we do. I know it was a long answer. No, that was perfect. I mean, it just like, when I think about all of what you're doing and what your platform is doing, uh, I think it's I think it's brilliant, and um, and what you said there about the companies going from one hundred to a thousand to twenty five hundred and more, and it's this momentum that is coming in, and the fact that you're actually preparing businesses ahead of time. It's, well, it's not really ahead of time in the sense that we're all supposed to be doing this already, whether we're mandated to do, to do it or not but you're preparing them for even the requirements that ultimately they're going to need to be aware of. And when we look at like right now we're in 2020 as the date of the risk recording, we've got 10 years, the UN has committed and all these countries have committed 193 countries, like you said, have committed to these goals. We've got 10 years to make this happen. And we're a long way away from from making that happen so the so if we're really committed to it then the momentum towards it will just only increase over this next 10 years so to prepare ahead of time versus trying to catch up would be a much wiser approach to this absolutely absolutely i agree with you on this uh, also considering the fact that this pandemic has already pushed back a uh, lot of good work that we have done in the last 10 years, whether it is with respect to child labor, whether it is with respect to vaccination, whether it is with respect to girls going to schools. There are a lot of pushbacks that have already happened. So all the hard work we put in from 2015 to now, it's uh, we are already getting pushed back on those. So it's like we have to again start, <laughs> may not be from zero, but yeah, we are not there where we were in uh, 2019 December. Yeah. So how receptive are businesses when you present this? I'm curious on how you actually get this message out other than doing podcasts like this yeah. and how receptive are they? I'm assuming that you're starting in India, but you also yeah. mentioned Brazil. And I know this is a, a platform that can be used in any country. Yes. So um, Nicole, I'll be honest with you. It's a very mixed response. Sometimes people have tons of money. Uh, I know I, I, I particularly, I don't want to take the name, but there's a huge business here in India, which is beating a lot of FMCG firms and has become uh, one of the biggest FMCG uh, chain here. Uh, I doubt that uh, if I were to tell them that, uh, please go ahead, uh, build your sustainability report, uh, because this is, it requires a lot of transparency. So it's a matter of uh, not just money or the budget to pay for it, uh, it's a matter of being uh, having the ethics and the courage, having that right kind of governance who can actually present a transparency uh, into their reporting. So 
it's it's not easy but we see already that a lot of uh, large organizations in india absolutely uh, go ahead whether they come on my platform and do it or not but they are absolutely working on sustainability reporting they really want to do it a uh, lot of them uh, so i'm uh, it's again it's not a pushback on the work but it's sometimes i may get a pushback on the platform which is fair enough uh, but smbs um, there's a lot of work to be done quite frankly because uh, they never did this if you even look at reports on where they stand today they never worked on this startups uh, they all have believed for a very long time and uh, somewhere the business schools and uh, the whole thought process of the generation is skewed that uh, shareholder wealth maximization is the purpose of business which is not true right which is not true it's an outcome of business the purpose of business has to be something else it has to meet, it has to map with the needs of the society yes and when you do good work you are uh, gifted you are uh, blessed or you you ultimately get some profit you you increase your wealth by the virtue of it but uh, somehow this whole thought process of uh, uh, building wealth and increasing shareholders value becomes uh, the only key uh, purpose and in that race people don't really give much uh, thought for the pro, uh, uh, purpose and that's uh, those kind of organization definitely we, we uh, get a pushback so uh, smbs it's not easy to get into with them uh, startups again there is a space called impact startups so when we work with impact startups when we work with impact investors it's easier because they quickly get it why because the bigger investor houses uh, and let me talk about the biggest one that i know of is the blackrock blackrock is a huge huge investment house and they clearly say we shall not invest in any business which is not planet positive which is not good for society we shall not how do you prove it to them that you are a good business you will have to show your work of past you will have to show your impact on the society you will have to show some kind of reporting and that is that is dg reporting that is the sustainability reporting and for that um at this stage a lot of startups are not ready a lot of smbs are not ready we do have to uh, coach them guide them make them aware uh there are a lot of partners who do that in fact there's a body called UNGCN United Nations Global uh, Compact Network its whole purpose of sitting in india is to do this to build awareness in fact there is an sdg academy which is built but that's more focused on the students and uh, currently they're most focused on universities but everybody needs to know about it and so for us uh, that option is uh, slower we do have 12 enterprise clients of which six are actively paying Twelve uh, are active, but six are paying clients, and uh, that means a lot for us. Uh, looking at a, uh, looking at uh, one and a half uh, years of work, I think we are not doing very bad. We're doing good, but this, uh, the moment the SaaS platform uh, is uh, being adopted, then it should be uh, uh, our job should be only to build awareness and move away from a lot of consulting, and then yeah. it should uh, take off better. Well, yeah, and to give some context for our listeners is that they are right now, as of this recording, they are just launching the, I mean, they have a platform up there. You can go to enterprise.fandoro.com. We'll make sure it's in the show notes, of course. That's already there. And they're going to be launching their their full platform just literally within a matter of weeks by the time this is actually released it'll it'll be live so this is something that you haven't been doing that long like you said one and a half years you yeah. started thinking about it two and a half years ago and um and i think that you'll i think that there's going to be a great momentum i believe that i believe what you're doing is is amazing i've been in business myself for over 30 years and it's interesting what you said about business and business's primary goal is not just to make money and i always thought that that like i just i just assumed that was just the way it was where it was it was mission driven my parents built businesses and that was always the case and then it was not until maybe like 15 even 10 years ago people started to say well you know uh we need to be a purpose driven business now and i'm like but isn't that what business was always about <laughs> So it somehow along the way we 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 lost touch at least in the capitalistic society we lost touch with the whole purpose 
and maybe in, in other societies that's different, it's a different conversation, but in, in terms of this, what we're talking about here is losing touch with the whole purpose of why we're doing it in the first place, creating so much value in the marketplace that the marketplace actually wants to pay you back for that and happily, willingly would bless you in return for the value that you have created for the community and for the marketplace and, and consumers and so forth. And so, um, so what you're doing is, is I said, I think it's fantastic. I think it'll start to build momentum. And that's why I wanted to have you on to share because I think there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be listening who are th the type of people, the type of business owners that would be interested in this. Like you said, not all business owners right now are going to be interested, but the more it's like momentum, the thousand, the, the hundred to the thousand to the 2,500 and the four, same thing here is, is that as more and more businesses adopt this philosophy and this approach to business, it will create pressure just naturally create pressure on other businesses to choose where they're going to be at because consumers are going to make their decision. And so we're, we're seeing that already now. Yeah, in fact, uh, you brought up a very good point and uh, uh, states definitely have a role to play here to make these more mandatory, more, they have to put around some pressure if they have, if needed because people need to wake up and realize that if there is no clean air, if there is no water, the water table is gone down. There is no business <laughs> because then there is a different kind of struggle. Uh, if we are going to have 30 degrees uh, centigrade uh, uh, heat waves, 30 degrees, I, I would be uh, yeah, in the Arctic this year. And I was like, what? It's not a temperature you get there. And it's, it's, if it's that kind of heat there, if we are losing ice there, uh, like irreparably, that, that uh, in fact, this year itself, we've lost so much ice now, which cannot be built back. Like even if we normalize the temperature, it's a sad state of affairs when you look at climate, but what you need to worry about is uh, this pandemic was only the start. When you are changing drastically the whole uh, ecology, the whole geography of it, how do you think what's going to happen with that melted ice? What do you think how, how the micros organisms living under them are going to behave? We don't know. We don't know there is so much there. And so that's one aspect of it. But when you bring in consumers, I always think that a lot of people debate with me. When I go to uh, startups, they say, we need to focus on uh, profits. We need to focus on reaching to the consumers. We can't spend time on this or money on this. And my... Uh, the thought to them is, or my point to them is, think of a cause that really, and, and Nicole, maybe you should do this exercise. I'm going to talk, ask you, think of a cause which is deeply, uh, you, you really deeply care for it. It really matters yeah. to you. It could be anything. And uh, then think of a brand that really touches that cause, works towards it, makes some meaningful progress in that space, do you really think you will be able to resist that brand or you will forget that brand when you really need something like that? Yeah. Today, the businesses are trying to, they're, they're already struggling to stand apart. They want their brands to look different. They want their brands, uh, uh, while they need to be exceptional in their category, but to create a differentiator, like I said earlier, the feature-based differentiation, product-based differentiation, their life cycle is very small now. Even the half life cycle of retaining those benefits is also getting smaller. So it's like, how do you be different? Well, become a purpose-driven uh, organization, touch people's life, be actually touch your consumer, find a set of consumers and uh, you don't have to have 100% uh, of the planet as your consumer. You have to have those 10% who care for a cause and work towards that cause and that gives you more benefit. And uh, that's where I always uh, feel like people are probably not thinking right. Uh, as they mature, uh, they start thinking. And that's why we see more large organizations, more bigger organizations, more mature CEOs uh, coming forward and working on it. But uh, those who are um, stuck with their why, oh, why profit, the CFOs or the CEOs who want to show their progress report every year, that I can't work on the long term, long term impacts. I have to show my uh, impact every year. Those kind of uh, attitudes probably are not seen in mature mature uh, managements. Yes, 
Yeah, and it's not the either or, it's the and. And that's what I think is we're, we're going to get, we're getting to slowly. There's already consumers that won't purchase from brands that are not supportive. And we're not talking about greenwashing here. We're talking about legitimately making a difference, legitimately uh, aligning with what they say their core values are, because some will say that this is what our core values are. But then when you actually look a little deeper, you realize that they're not actually applying them or they're doing things that are actually contrary to that. And I think that more and more consumers are looking for authenticity. They're looking for the transparency, the accountability and the responsibility. And so um, it's, it's crazy times. It's also exciting times as we begin to right size. And I think it's going to be missed. It's going to be very messy in between <laughs> perhaps <laughs> to get to a better outcome ultimately. And, um, but that takes, like I just said, it takes accountability. It takes responsibility. It takes uh, activation. And so getting people involved in it. So, um, so thank you for sharing what you're doing. Smita, I'm, I'm excited about it. And I'm looking forward to hearing how this develops as it grows. And I think there's some things that we can do even in alignment with what you're doing and with what Leaders of Transformation is about. So um, yeah, I just really, I really acknowledge what you're, what you're up to is great. And also for our listeners, yes, and for our listeners as well, we appreciate you being here and listening. And I would encourage you to go to enterprise.fandoro.com and find out more about this. If you have questions, reach out. I'm sure that Smita and her team are happy to answer those questions for you. And uh, yeah, so you were gonna say something. What's your final, final thoughts for our listeners? Firstly, thank you so much, Nicole, for having me here. And uh, it's exciting. And I, I heard about your work too. I'm so looking forward to uh, the gender index, uh, sorry, G generosity index, right? Yes. So something to that tune. I, I'm so looking forward to it and I definitely want to hear more about it as it comes up. Um, from my end, uh, yes, I definitely want to request all people who are listening to this, uh, please do come to my site and have a look. If you are into any kind of business, if whether it is startup, whether it is a medium-sized company, whether it is small or a large organization, We'll be very happy to work with you, help you identify uh, where, what are your sustainability related risks and opportunities and help you find your purpose and make sure you get a, you are able to get enough talkability around it once you work on it. So uh, I think that's only a good business. Like Nicole said, it's not uh, this or that, it's both. You have to be functionally benefit, uh, profitable as well as be purpose led. So. That's where the future is, and I'm sure that's where most organizations are headed to. So I hope to see all of you there. Awesome. Thank you, Smita. And I always say leaders of, transforma leaders of transformation take action. So take action on something that you learned today. I found it very fascinating, even just the journey and how it's all structured. And maybe you have an idea as well that... Um, uh, Smita alluded to it with the generosity index, which is something that we're working on. There's a few of us that are working and collaborating on that uh, as well. A platform, another platform that I'm building for the podcast space. And so as I listen to how they have structured their startup, uh, there's a lot of things that we can learn from that. And if you have an idea, maybe you want to uh, look at, you know, going back to this interview again, listening to it, but also going to their platform and unpacking it as to how are they doing, not just what are they doing, but how are they doing it and how can we apply that to the idea that we're passionate about? And so uh, I think that as we work together and we start learning from each other, we can accelerate kind of what we were talking about earlier, we can accelerate the progress uh, towards making this world a better place. And that's not just a cliche, it literally is the passion, the heart that we have. And so, and I know that is the case for you because otherwise you wouldn't be listening here and uh, because that's what the Leaders of Transformation is all about. So we appreciate you being here. We thank you. We look forward to seeing you uh, again on the next episode of Leaders of Transformation real soon. And go to leadersoftransformation.com. We've got almost, what is it, uh, 350 episodes there now of amazing difference makers and world changers that you can learn from to inspire you, to keep you on this journey uh, and, and keep you going, keep you motivated and inspired 
along your journey. And if there's anything we can do, uh, reach out to us and let us know. Again, thank you so much. And we'll look forward to seeing you in the next episode real soon.